like to do, introduce first off Mr. Brian Summerlad. Mr. Brian is the founder of and chairman of Clap Charity and an honorary consultant, plastic surgeon at GOSH. He is a past president of both the British Association of Plastic Surgeons and the Craniofacial Society of Great Britain and Ireland. He works regularly with cleft teams in Bangladesh, Egypt, Sri Lanka, Iran, the Kurdish region of Iraq, and Uganda. Thank you so much, Brian, for, for leading this roundtable discussion. I invite you to please unmute yourself as you introduce our first panelist. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to uh, lead this discussion, and I look forward to some very interesting uh, contributions. We just had a couple of excellent plenary talks to introduce the, the, the scene. So, Alpha, so you've heard uh, what my role is. I've actually been really not very involved in COVID, I'm afraid, um, as our routine work stopped and is only just beginning to restart. Um, and unfortunately, the situation in the UK appears to be heading in the wrong direction at the moment with, uh, with a second wave. So I'll be very interested to hear from three people from very different countries, one from Argentina, one from Bulgaria, and one from Kenya. So our first speaker is an old friend of mine, Carolina Cromaro, and I have known each other for a long time. I've had the pleasure of working with her in Argentina and having her daughter staying in our house. Um, Carolina is a, is a pediatric surgeon and, well, you can read it. Founding member of the association Simi Sumac, a nonprofit organization that provides comprehensive cleft care in Santiago del Estero, which is in the north of a very beautiful part of uh, Argentina. Uh, as you can see, she also teaches genetics and surgery at the university. She's a member of the Argentinian National Network of Congenital Anomalies and longtime partner of Smile Trainer and Transforming Faces. Carolina. Hi. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Sommerle, uh, for your kind words. I'm Carolina. I'm a pediatric surgeon in Santiago del Estero, Argentina. I work in a cleft lip and palate interdisciplinary team in a public health field system. The activity of our team has been severely affected uh, by the first two months of COVID-19 shutdown. So we decided to look for a different way of work that allowed us to maintain the continuity of care for our patients, trying not to lose the best treatment opportunity for each discipline. Um, the core idea was to minimize face-to-face -face activity and carry on on face-to-face -face activity respecting epidemiological regulations to avoid infections to patients, their contact, and health staff. And speech therapy and psychological therapy are providing virtual attention uh, through different platforms. There is a national program called telemedicine because not every patient in, uh, in the north of Argentina has uh, access to mobile phone or internet. So they can go to the hospital uh, near where they live and use the, the telemedicine uh, program in the hospital. Our, our team is also using WhatsApp and social media. And we have confirmed a very good response uh, by the patients and their families uh, through social media and was uh, for this kind of activities. Um, also, we believe that human contact is necessary for a successful relationship between the patient and his or her therapist. Um, in surgery, next please. Next slide. Okay. And next one, next one. Okay, uh, in surgery, uh, before the pandemic, we used to perform four surgery, surgical procedures per week. After two months of suspension of a scheduled surgery, surgical activity done to shut down, we decided to present to the health authorities a proposal to return to surgical activity for our program, performing only two surgical procedures per week. 
uh, we selected primary CRC patients only, beginning by those who had the biggest delay in their operations. Um, the selection criteria were delay in surgical opportunity, general surgical condition of the patient, epidemiological situation of the environmental and the place where the patient lives, hospital admission two days before surgery day with a single adult companion, only the mother usually, and in an isolating room, we can do that, uh, you know, get an isolating room for only the patient and the mother. In 24 hours, the, the hospital received uh, the outcome of the, of the PCR uh, testing. If negative, the surgical operation is performed. If positive, the patient and his companion are isolated and COVID-19 protocol for confirmed cases take place. We have not had any positive COVID-19 patient yet, so in, in CLEP surgeries. Surgery is performed strictly um, with uh, following strictly safety, safety protocols for operating room. We try to minimize the number of people in the operating room, which for us is uh, very difficult because you know, in Latin America, we are very social because um, usually in, in an operating room, many people come and go, come and go. So that was a big change. Um, but we are, we are getting that strict rules now. Um, uh, the transportation from the patient's home to the hospital is done uh, by an official vehicle uh, of the Ministry of Health, so the patient uh, is not traveling on their own. And post-operative cares are controlled by using telemedicine program uh, in, in the presence of a physician or a nurse uh, of the local hospital. So the, the patient does not come back for a control, a post-operative control at the hospital. So we believe organization is the best approach um, uh, we, we have shown the, the use of microscope that uh, we learned from Dr. Somerla, and we believe also that maybe there is a possibility of, uh, you know, not getting so close to the, to the patient. And uh, we know that the burden of care is uh, increasing, but it's something that we cannot uh, avoid. And um, we hope that this uh, will pass uh, because we are human beings, being uh, social creatures. So we need a uh, uh, touch, you know, human contact. But and we believe we cannot suspend all uh, surgical activity. So that's our main goal now. Thank you. That's all. Thank you very much, Carolina. We're, we're going to move on with the, the three presentations and then it's open to everyone to, to join in. Uh, so carrying on with the theme of, of risk management, which is what this roundtable is about. The next speaker is Professor Yuri Anastasov. I've, he and I have met, he reminded me we met in Spain as well as meeting in his home, beautiful hometown of Plovdiv in Bulgaria. He's, as you can see, head of the plastic and craniofacial unit in the University of Plovdiv, founder of the Association of Facial Anomalies, uh, which is a, a, a national cleft organization. Um, and he's also been a partner of Smile Train and the European Cleft Organization and Transforming Faces. So Yuri, welcome. Thank you very much for this introduction. I uh, would like to show the map of course where is bulgaria because it's always uh, difficult to 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 have the idea where it is uh, oh it's a small country and uh, i work in the second uh, city in bulgaria plovdiv and uh, we have uh, from uh, 25 years uh, been the unique center for cleft lip and palate patient in our country treating 90 percent of the patients uh, can I have the next, please? 
So we, I have to explain a little bit the situation in uh, Bulgaria because uh, the government is uh, supporting only surgery. So we know from experience that uh, only parents and specialists can uh, build something that could really help the, the comprehensive care of clefts. So we have this association created uh, more than 20 years ago. And uh, thanks to this, uh, a big part of our success is uh, uh, because of this uh, symbiotic work between patients and specialists. Can I have the next, please? Our center exists uh, and uh, our uh, particular uh, activity is that we have uh, created a network of uh, contact parents from 2009. We have a network of speech therapists with co-funded programs uh, by Transforming Faces. We have also a network of orthodontists uh, also co-funded program and uh, a network of feeding specialists and we have a network of ENT doctors. So all these uh, networks have been uh, uh, set up in an uh, electronic medical record that is uh, something particular for our country. Next please. This is, these are the, the networks and the coordinators of these networks. Uh, in the next room, uh, Dr. Veliko will explain uh, something about her experience uh, about the, the dental and orthodontic care. So she's also present in this, uh, in this uh, meeting. The next please. So our country was uh, in the beginning not too much affected uh, and uh, we had uh, only uh, only at one month and a half uh, complete uh, lockdown with severe restrictions. But from June to August and to now, uh, all the all the activities are reopened. We have uh, football events. Uh, the masks are not mandatory, so we have also street protests from two months and more. So this is uh, really. Uh, dramatic uh, negative factor for the number of cases. We didn't see so many cases, even with this uh, open open uh, measures that are not uh, strict at all. And uh, still our hospitals and uh, uh, IQ uh, unit are not uh, saturated. But uh, we are afraid because uh, in reality, we don't have any real uh, idea about the situation because our hospitals are profit type organizations and they prefer not to stop any activity because they will lose money. So in some hospitals in the country, there is uh, obligatory mandatory testing of patients and some others are uh, completely uh, subjective appreciation if you have some doubts. So. In the last uh, weeks, we have been uh, thinking about uh, uh, the capacity to organize something that will control, especially the cleft lip and palate patients. But in our unit, we are treating not only clefts. So it's very difficult to, to separate cleft patients from other patients. And uh, we have also to, to do some periodic tests of uh, the staff. So, we cannot act independently of the government and the hospital. Next, please. So we have been trying to do as much as we can to do logical and uh, uh, possible measures. So we have been trying to, in our unit, to reinforce our sanitary and hygienic protective uh, measures, reducing the number of people in the same room uh, and uh, prioritizing the primary cases for surgery. Uh, we had been also uh, trying to organize our staff uh, meetings through Zoom. Uh, that was helpful. In Bulgaria, even before the COVID, uh, uh, patients are very often uh, linked with the, uh, the specialist by uh, uh, Viber, uh, WhatsApp, and uh, so the contact between patients and specialists is very easy. So uh, we have uh, 
disadvantage in the country because the internet is very cheap and uh, our particular advantage in this situation is that we have been uh, from seven years using uh, an electronic uh, medical record uh, system that was in this situation much more used than previously. Can I have the next please? So this electronic medical record is, uh, is something that I should have more time to explain it, but it's a, it's a, it's a platform that gives the, the, to the patient and the specialist to upload pictures, videos uh, consecutively uh, through the life of the patient and during the consultation, the surgery. So the patient is uh, uh, able to, to send pictures and videos uh, and uh, we receive uh, a, all the time this uh, uh, new post uh, in our uh, network. Next, please. These are the, the typical uh, gallery of uh, the life of a patient from the zero to 18 years. And this is how we are organizing our uh, documentation from seven years now. And we are trying now to upgrade this system to have uh, much more uh, specific uh, uh, criteria for our work and also for the statistic of the treatment that is done. Next, please. So every time we receive a message that somebody is writing a new post, next, please. We have reminders for different age period that the patient has to come. Next, please. And actually, during this uh, pandemic situation, much more patients are sending pictures and videos even uh, to show us that something is happening and we are really avoiding much more in the than in the past uh, the physical contact when it's possible. Next, please. And uh, actually, we are also participating, Allah is participating in a new project uh, that will train parents and uh, for training parents for speech therapy. And this is uh, something that could be uh, really uh, something that could help uh, instead of the, the, the speech therapist to have a, a, a mother and pa or a father. Uh, doing the speech therapy at home when it has received the, the training. So this is our specific uh, apport, but we are still not having the solution that will give the solution for everybody. Please, the next. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope that it has given a, an idea of what we have done. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yuri, that was very interesting, uh, and we'll, uh, I, I'm sure that'll produce a lot of discussion. Your um, electronic system, record system, looks fantastic. So the last speaker in this session, in this roundtable on risk management, is uh, Dr. Zipra Gathuya, who's a, an anesthetist or anesthesiologist from uh, Kenya. Uh, and in some ways, uh, Anesthesiologists have been at the, the forefront in, in the battle, in this fight against, if you like it, if you see it as a fight against COVID. So, Supra, where, where is she? I'm here. Right. You can, you can hear me? Now I can see you. Good. Okay, so I'm going to talk about how we were navigating the risks of COVID-19 to resume treatment in Africa. I'll start by saying that I, on the Global Medical Advisory Board for Smile Train and also the Africa Medical Council, Advisory Council for Smile Train, and I'm going to speak in that capacity rather than from a hospital perspective. And when COVID-19 was declared a pandemic, uh, Africa was lagging behind. So we had the advantage of learning what was happening in other places. What we saw was very worrying. And our main challenge and what we feared most, what, what the pandemic would do to our already weakened healthcare systems in Africa. And as a medical advisory council, we had to think very fast and quickly how to guide the progression of 
comprehensive care for cleft lip and palate patients that we take care of as Smile Train. Next. As, as a way of going back is that when the pandemic was declared, we suspended all comprehensive cleft care services. This was in line with uh, most of our government's uh, positions where all elective surgeries were suspended, meaning that uh, there were no elective surgeries that were going to happen. Uh, people needed to prepare their systems. We don't have a lot of resources, so most of the resources were on hold for what would happen to the pandemic. And the projections were that we would get to our uh, peaks very quickly. The numbers will be overwhelming. There will be overwhelming of the health systems. And there was a need to design a plan for what services could happen and what could not in collaboration with whatever else was happening within the countries that, that we support and what the national guidelines and national governments were proposing. The other thing is that there are also very few healthcare providers in our part of the world. So if COVID was going to become a major issue, most of the people who also provide care for comprehensive cleft care will be the same ones providing care for the for the COVID cases, especially anesthesia providers. Next. So as we progressed, we, we looked, the numbers were not as overwhelming for COVID as had been projected. There was a lot of uh, talk about backlog. Some places had very few cases, some countries had very few cases. Uh, some of the partners were agitating to start offering cleft uh, care services again. So as an advisory council, we decided to do a survey that would show us where most of our partners were so that as we gave uh, guidelines on, on advice on how to proceed, then we would know what was happening. So when we did that, we saw that a lot of our partners supported uh, resumption of care. This was in line also with reception of elective surgeries from most uh, government bodies that were advising that elective surgeries uh, come back. One of the reasons for this was that with the cancellation of elective lists and the fear mongering that went with COVID-19, even people who needed normal care which could be offered were staying away from the hospitals. And the government felt that that staying away from hospital was causing more harm, morbidity and mortality than COVID itself. And there were a lot of people, especially with pre-existing conditions that were suffering and not getting their care and also immunization for children. So they needed to bring back some form of normalcy so that these services could be seen to be coming back to normal. And that was uh, very helpful. So doing this survey and seeing that most of our partners were supportive of our resuming surgeries was quite impressive. Next. One of the things that we were aware of is that COVID-19 is a highly infectious disease and there was need to determine because small train fads, uh, surgeries in our partners for cleft air patients only and we do not want the cleft patients to receive uh, better care than the other patients are receiving in the same hospital. So one of the things that we had to find out was how available were PPEs and were they relying on PPEs from small train? And it was good to know that more than half of the partners were not relying on the organization to get PPEs, that means they had other ways, other ways of getting of getting the, the PPEs, which was very impressive because then we would know that even if we advise for reception of surgeries, then it will not be a burden on Smile Train per se as an organization to provide the PPEs. Next. 
this one was now quite interesting because we wanted to see how telemedicine was being uh, adapted for cleft care. And just at a half of the partners were using telemedicine. And this is an area that we feel, still feel has a great opportunity, like Yuri says, to grow and to improve care. And unfortunately, uh, unlike you, this country, our internet access is not universal. Many people don't have uh, uh, cell phones or a way of uh, communicating as such, though it is not as bad as it would be. And then also, um, because for most part, we haven't gone into electronic medical records. It is something new. We haven't had uh, scenarios where this was happening regularly. But I think now going forward, this is one of the opportunities that COVID has shown us that telemedicine is actually something we need to work on and, and move, move forward with next. And this was for those ones who are using telemedicine, the main thing is mainly phone call and WhatsApp. And WhatsApp, you probably can send pictures, sometimes not, but you can see that oh, there were very few people who had anything else that you can actually send pictures. Mobile phones, people could call and ask for advice, but not much, much else. Next. So in conclusion, we, we were dealing with partners from across different countries who are all in different positions in terms of mitigating the risk for COVID-19. And one of the things that uh, as an advisory council we saw was that the reception of services has to be informed by what the local circumstances are. And we cannot, as an organization, say now stop all surgeries or resume all surgeries because different people are in different places. Some of the partner hospitals have been made into COVID centers, and that will, will inform how soon they can resume uh, the services. Some have availability of PPEs as a way of uh, limiting how much can be resumed. And of course, in our part of the world, we are always concerned about um, our levels of uh, testing. We think that our testings have been very low. Though it, we are happy to say like in Kenya now, the graph has gone down on the first wave. So we are not yet on the second wave and we're hoping that uh, it shall not be uh, bad even as the first one was not as bad. But we have realized that telemedicine will have to become an integral part of uh, comprehensive cleft care, especially when we have people cannot move around as much. We are not likely to have face-to-face uh, -face conferences. We have, even for education, has to go a lot of telemedicine, like what we're doing now that a lot of these conferences and uh, update of skills will have to go online in some way. And I think that having this kind of setup and this kind of uh, a conference sets us for in a very good footing going forward, even after COVID, to know that there's a lot that we can do from very many different parts of the world by collaborating together without even moving out of our, our spaces. So thank you very much. I hope that uh, people will come up with ideas of how to resume surgeries in their respective places, depending on what their local circumstances are. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zipporah. That's, that's very interesting. What will, we have almost, well, we have 45 minutes, I think, um, for discussion. Just to remind you, this is this roundtable is primarily about risk management, um, both for, for patients and for surgeons and speech pathologists, team members. Um, 
I'm sure that there'll be other aspects of the COVID pandemic that will be interesting, that you, you'll be interested in. But let's try to at least begin the discussion talking about risk management particularly. So please ask your questions, make your comments. Could you just say who you are? And let's throw it open. Hi, I'm Tawin Junior from Malawi. Hello. Hi. Yeah, I I just have a quick question about the risk management. And my basic uh, my basic area is on the infection prevention control measures. Hasn't been highlighted much, so I'm so much interested because I'm a nurse. But then usually surgeons are not in the forefront of doing the infection prevention practices. So how are we going to do about it, especially in procedures? Thank you. Answers. Would you like to give your comments, uh, to Winnie? Okay. Well, my thinking was um, maybe orienting the uh, the operation smile volunteers to learn more on infection prevention control measures and probably have maybe a session for surgeons and uh, nurses as well, especially the ones that are working in the OR. And another way is to make sure that the people that we work with, especially in the hospitals, they should be able to be oriented on how, in, in this pandemic, how we're supposed to manage or handle patients, especially when we're preventing the infection. And making sure that the, the supplies are available so that everyone is able to use the uh, proper or appropriate protective equipment that is required at that particular point. Because it's not all the time that we can use all the PPEs at, at every time, but we still have to choose which one at which appropriate time. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Brian, can I make a comment? Yes. Yes, I think infection prevention control is a very important aspect of uh, our risk management in this area. But I think the most important thing is to, number one, to understand the principles of the infection. Some of these things we have been doing uh, even before COVID came, but now even more. Once we understand the principles very well, and then mode of transmission and the risks where we get most risks and what we can do to prevent those. And the other thing is to also understand the levels of protections that we get from different levels of PPEs to understand that very well. Once we have the principles, I think that is easy to understand. And to actually realize that there is no PPE that is 100% protective and you have to use them correctly for the correct prevention to be able to, to avoid the risk of getting the disease. And one of the other things, I think for infection control, it is better for people to be trained as teams rather than as silos. So everybody, because we work on patients together, the surgeons, anesthesia, uh, nursing, theater attendants, everybody. I think for infection control, it is important for us to work, to be trained as a team, just the same way that we will work as a team, then everybody knows to watch for everybody else. Karen. Hi, hi everybody, I'm Karen Wong, I'm a plastic surgeon at SickKids. Um, I'm, I, I actually really appreciate that comment that Tawini just made because we, we have some data coming out of, uh, of Canada that shows that a lot of the um, infections that have happened in healthcare workers are in, uh, in women and in nursing staff. And so 
you can kind of understand that because they're they're the ones that spend the most time face to face with patients. Um, and so, you know, I thought it was interesting how that Carolina mentioned that um, they're able to isolate patients and admit them preoperatively. Um, I think that's, I mean, obviously you need to be resourced, well resourced to be able to do that. Right now we're trying to have COVID tests on every patient preoperatively that's um, 72 hours, at least a, a, a maximum of 72 hours before surgery and then we ask them to isolate after that. Um, and so I wonder how access to testing um, might be a limiting factor uh, in, in lower resource settings. Can I ask you all to put your hand up if, if your patients are all having preoperative um, PCR uh, antigen testing? Okay, but many not. Yeah, um, Dr. Samora, um, what we had to do is to reduce the number of the surgeries. We are, we, we are only allowed to perform two surgeries a week um, because of the cost of the PCR and the, the amount of, of, of patients that are requiring PCR testing. Um, but maybe if we get more uh, PCR uh, supplies, we can perform more. Um, we have a, a room uh, where we can isolate the mother and the child, but I, I think that is important. But uh, before COVID, we will uh, admission the patient the same day of the surgery. Now the 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 stay of the patient becomes a lot longer than it used to. So that's a problem, but that's the only solution we could find for now. Thank you. Lukman. Thank you, Brian. I'm uh, Lukman uh, Majid, plastic surgeon from Iraq. Uh, my question is, uh, most of the surgeries we are doing, they are uh, for children under five years. Cleft patients, majority are under five years. And is COVID-19 available in those children? Or are, are they contagious? So you're asking how, how, how many of those children are, are infected? Yes, uh, I'm asking how many of the children are infected because uh, in our country we don't have uh, a routine test for children. When uh, we see that they have flu-like illness, we just postpone the patient. But uh, a routine PCR test is not done for children. Comments? Uh, I can speak to the experience in Canada. We know that our, our kids and infants do indeed have the virus, but they don't necessarily show symptoms of it as much as the older patients, but they are still able to transmit the virus. Um, so I think our concern is more that if we have a positive patient come in for surgery, then they'll transmit it to everybody else without everyone knowing because they may not have the, the flu-like symptoms. Can I, have, can, can I say a quick comment Sorry, about Carla first. Carla, yeah, just, 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 to add, just to add, hi, I'm Carla Florin uh, from Fundación Gantz in Santiago, Chile. Just to uh, add a, a quick comment to Karen, uh, because we are uh, seeing also some, uh, uh, is that positive, uh, no, false, uh, false negative PCR. So this is, a, and it, it's a high, it's a high percentage, around 25%. So it's not some, something that you can just rely 100% on if you have a PCR, a negative PCR. So maybe uh, we, for instance, for us, is just to take all the patients and uh, treat it as 
they are probably a COVID positive. Yuri. I would like to uh, add uh, a political uh, value of the problem because uh, if it's a question of money, if we have enough money, we can test everybody and we can prolongate a little bit the, the stay and it could solve the problem. So we have uh, the knowledge that there is a risk. We have to, to have more security, but at least in our country and maybe in other places, the problem is political because if you find that there is many cases in some place, you have to stop everything. This will, this will stop the economy also. And so part of the problem is that people uh, begin to have uh, fake news of what is happening. This is part of the drama of the COVID situation. Uh, it's very easy to protect the patient. If you have the test, you can organize it and you can have very little risk of anything. But uh, the problem is that you stop a lot of other things in the same time that you find something that happened. And this is the major problem. In our country, it's clear that as it's not a very, very big amount of cases, it's a small country, not too much contact. It's not like uh, a big city with 20 million. Our cities are less than 1 million. So it's not a big problem, but it's still not clear at all because there is not a clear uh, wish to solve the problem. Because if you solve it, you have then it's, it's another case that will come from other countries. So the pandemic is a pandemic. So you cannot stop the pandemic and this will continue to create problems for a long period in the future. So okay. this is my, we have to take it and to think that we have to solve with the less possible risks, but we are, we are not able to isolate ourselves. If you are rich also, if you are poor, this happens to everybody. But thank you. Some of you are, are not showing your, your, we're not seeing your faces. Can, can those of you who aren't showing your videos say hello? And, hello. Uh, uh, yes, Adley. Hi, I'm Adelaide, speech um, therapist from Ghana. Um, so I'm really happy to hear all that um, everyone is saying, really interesting discussions. Um, Dr. Wong, Karen Wong mentioned that um, the children do carry a lot, um, they tend to be carriers and then spread a lot. And so here, while we are not doing so much of face-to-face um, -face therapy, not everybody also has access to the phones and the data for teletherapy, which we are still trialing. And so every once in a while, you may have somebody who book a face-to-face -face appointment, but we don't have access to tests in the clinics or in the at least the speech and hearing center clinic. So what we do is maybe check for temperature. Um, the therapist will wear the mask. The parents will wear a mask, but the child isn't. Every once in a while, when you need to do, say, blow bubbles or do some activities, you want the child to see your mouth. So your mask can ha may have to come off. And, you know, it could be a, a, a small chance where you you exposed. And so I was really wondering if there were any ideas around this that anybody could throw. But basically, this is what we are also doing here in Ghana um, regarding speech therapy. I know that everyone is talking about surgery and stuff, so sorry no, about I, that. No, I think it's very important. We want to talk about surgery, we want to talk about anesthesia, and we want to talk about speech therapy. And if, do we have any, um, any orthodontist, dentist? So just to come back to speech therapy, you, you can keep a, a two meter distance, can't you? Even with, with, with masks off. Do you still yeah. feel at risk if you if you if you keep keep your distance? Two meters, yes. Sometimes you can. Other times, you know, children are not used to all these rules and regulations. So even wearing the mask and everything, it feels foreign. But once they accept it, sometimes you know they 
I think they like the touch. So you try to maintain as much distance. Sometimes you even let the parents actually engage or do things with the child while you are sitting a few meters away, just so that you're being safe and it's the child and parents. So we do manage our way around it. Um, it's not okay. foolproof, but so far no one has been infected. So we are happy about that. We just hope that there'll be things um, that we could look into. And do you use any, any PPE apart from a mask? Um, gloves, yes, gloves. Gloves and masks. Okay. Uh, and we sanitize uh, um, after each session. Sure, sorry. Carla. Uh, um, I'm just, uh, I would like to, to tell you that uh, our, in our uh, center, our uh, speech language therapist and trying to use this uh, a sort of mask with a, like a window, but this window is not open. It's, it's uh, with um, the clear um, um, film. Transparent. Transparent. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, apart from the, the face shield uh, okay. or the face shield okay. as well. So this is, this is one way that they could have a, a very interactive way, in-person assessment and, the, and therapy. Mm -hmm. This could Thank be you. one option. Uh, uh, just Thank carrying you. on with the speech therapy theme, how much have you tried what Yuri was talking about of uh, teaching parents how to remotely, how to then give therapy for their children? So we've done a few and um, we, we had a cleft camp for 12 weeks and then shortly after that COVID rolled in. And so they had had um, weekly sessions for a while. And so some of it, we had recorded the sessions during the camp for parents to just follow at home. Or we had had parents witness what, the, what was happening during the camp. So they knew what they could do and then we just follow up with phone calls because again, um, the issue of um, Phones and data is a bit tricky for all the families. So you can't really be sure that you can do everything. So we relied on previous videos from sessions and then calling in and asking if there was any support we could give them um, with regards to that. So yes, we have followed up with a few, but not many, not many of them at all. So I think we can do more of that, teaching the parents um, what to do, but there was also the fear of coming out. So everybody just wanted to stay indoors. It's now that the restrictions are easing a lot more. So hopefully we should get along with that. Perhaps I could just mention um, Speech at Home, which is a project being developed by Debbie Sell from, from uh, UK and Trina Swinney from, from Ireland, specifically this idea of teaching parents um, how, to give, how to give therapy, which I think is particularly useful potentially in, in low and middle in, income countries. Can we just uh, say something about anesthesia? Um, I don't know if there are any other uh, anesthesiologists apart from Zipporah, but how do you, what, what do you do in terms of PPE? And do you modify, for example, intubation, which I presume is the most, or intubation and extubation, taking off and landing are the two most risky parts of the exercise. What do you, what special things do you do, Zipporah, for um, anesthetizing these patients? So a lot of things have been tried during this period. And like uh, Sarah was saying at the plenary session, intubation has become very difficult now because visibility is a problem. You have to wear a face mask. You have a face shield. Some people are using the intubating box which makes it just so complex that uh, even an airway that wasn't particularly difficult becomes difficult airway. So sometimes you find that, especially when you have a difficult airway scenario, that it becomes even more complicated. So one of the things that we've been trying to do is for elective cases, not to do patients we have assessed as having a difficult airway to start with, because even a normal airway is proving to be quite difficult to access in this era. The other thing is we've been uh, having these guidelines about avoiding uh, bagging, uh, avoiding uh, open suctions, 
and avoiding um, anything that can, because it's an aerosol generating procedure to prevent the dispersion of that aerosolized uh, sperm. So one of the things is to uh, do rapid sequence induction. So mo for most part, we are doing rapid sequence induction. Sometimes for children, you don't have a line, you have to do uh, gas induction. So for this one, we are trying to do two person technique so that uh, the one person who is holding the mask and the one who is uh, breathing for the patient have actually complete seal and this is quite difficult also for cleft patients. So it's a difficult scenario and people have to really be careful and, and learn how to don and doff um, for these patients. For patients who are confirmed COVID, then we do complete uh, doning with PPEs, including uh, the whole works. For patients who have been tested negative, then gloves, face mask and a face shield uh, uh, have been sufficing. Okay. What, what sort of patients, what sort of COVID positive patients are you operating on? Not mainly for cleft patients, but for the other patients, especially there's been a lot of, uh, the other thing is that we've been using a lot of regional anesthesia for those ones that we can do regional anesthesia. So that is one of the other areas that has grown quite extensively. So doing uh, epidurals and spinals and nerve blocks for anybody where you can use those ones. But again, for cleft patients, because we are sharing the airway, we have to intubate, we have to be right there. But most of the children, uh, have not had issues with uh, a positive risk. Our rates for kids having a positive COVID PCR is low, but we are not routinely testing children under five for COVID. So for those ones, we just assume that they 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 we use the gloves, the masks, and the face shield to proceed okay. with the surgery. Right. Thank you. Most of you, the biggest group of, of, uh, of people in this round table are, are surgeons. Can we, can we talk about uh, surgical PPE? Can you give us your experiences of, of how you're managing, for example, a cleft palate repair, uh, what, what sort of PPE you're using, how you found it? Um, well, yeah. it, it, I think it's actually very uncomfortable, the PPE uh, equipment, and um, we we believe that uh, using the microscope, you know, you keep a distance. I mean, you told me that <laughs> um, uh, you are keeping a a distance even before the COVID nineteen. So. Um, um, we are actually not using much of a, only a mask. We are using mask. maybe two masks. Mm -hmm. Two masks. Um, I find the that mask uh, nine nineteen and nineteen very uncomfortable. So I use two masks and uh, my glasses and the microscope. And I hope there will be enough. Um, I don't know. I and don't think about, anybody else, anybody knows. So. What about what about a lip repair? What you what you're using for a lip repair? Um, the last ones we are doing it with the microscope also. Okay. Um, because we believe at the beginning we use the 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 loops, you know, the microscope loops, magnifying loops, and uh, two masks. And then we thought, why don't we perform the, the lip repair with the microscope as well? So we did that. And um, it works. It, we think it works, but we, the truth is that we, we, we still didn't have any patient with COVID-19. Hmm. 
So I don't know what will happen if we have one. Or, or we have been lucky, I don't know. Yuri. You, you still to, muted. to share my experience because uh, in the beginning we have been very scared and uh, we have tried to have uh, all the mask and cleaning all the time all, uh, our hands before and after then uh, everybody begin to be a little bit more uh, relaxed with all this uh, data that are not scaring in our country but uh, recently we had a patient that has been in contact with COVID-19 and something like that. So I was waiting my uh, negative test uh, for one day with the same thing when you have done sex without preservative. And when it happens that I'm negative, I was very happy. So it's the same feeling that when you don't see any case in front of you that is COVID, you are a little bit more uh, relaxed. But uh, when you have a case that is uh, positive, real or contact, suddenly the situation changed completely. So it's a, it's a funny situation when it's negative, but uh, it's still a dramatic one that uh, you are not sure and waiting for the result. <laughs> Other comments about Lutman? Uh, thank you, Brian. Uh, I uh, normally use microscope uh, for cleft palate repairs, but for cleft lip, I use uh, loops, uh, wearing a mask, and uh, I, I think both can protect us. Uh, a loop and a mask together can uh, play a role uh, like a, a shield, a transparent shield. Uh, I also use transparent shield during uh, outpatient contact with the patients, but uh, I had PCR test negative for myself, but for the patients, we only took history. history. We didn't uh, routinely examine them if they are PCR negative or not. Has anyone tried using the shield in front of loops? Uh, Sorry, go ahead, Karen. Oh, sorry. Color first. Uh, yes, we are doing. Unfortunately, I, I'm not the chance to uh, to operate on a palate uh, with microscope. But uh, now we are doing well, double mask uh, loops, and in front of the loop, uh, a face shield. So this is this is quite tricky because uh, that shield needs to be clear and without any more um, uh, reflecting the light as well. Uh, so trying to not to interfere much with the, with the vision. Uh, so we, we are lucky that our nurses uh, look for every, everywhere uh, just to get the, the a proper face shield. But this is the way that we are operating at the moment. Carolina, you had a comment? Yeah, um, I tried to use the mask in front of the loop and I couldn't. So I just took the mask yeah, off the, the, the loop. Yeah. Yeah. You can no. see. If you put the I, mask in front of the loop. You... <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm, going to show, I'm going to show you some pictures afterwards. Okay. Yes, and, and this is when you get used to actually you don't realize that you have uh, so many PPE on. Okay, because the mask that I have, it, it was not possible. A face shield. Yes. Look one. Uh, yeah, I tried to use the uh, transparent shield with the loop, but actually it was very distracting to me. So I couldn't continue with the uh, shield. I removed it and then uh, performed my surgery. It was very distracting. Are you using uh, Are you using double gloves? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I use a double glove uh, because I have uh, allergy to the uh, powder. So I normally uh, use double gloves uh, and glo uh, and powder glove. We we have only a sterile powdered glove. So I use a powdered non-sterile glove. I uh, disinfect my uh, gloves and then we are the. Uh, powdered glove after that. And and are you mm -hmm. wearing double gowns? No, it wasn't Special a double gown, gown but a uh, double mask. I use double mask. Mm -hmm. uh, the gown was only one gown. How is you, how are you interacting as a cleft team, as a multidisciplinary team? Is that uh, how much has that suffered? meeting with your speech and language therapy colleagues, your orthodontic colleagues, has, yeah, look me. Uh, actually, we uh, saw the patient as a team. Uh, we were four patients, uh, uh, me with Nauza, the speech pathologist, uh, uh, Joan, as you know, she's also a plastic surgeon. So we were uh, four and uh, a nurse also does, uh, checking the names and uh, the data of the patient. So we were all together in, in the same room. We, we are uh, wearing transparent uh, masks and uh, gloves to see the patients, but uh, only the transparent shield. Sometimes I couldn't continue to speak, to speak with the patients uh, or their parents. I had to remove the ordinary mask and uh, speak with them, but I was continuously wearing the transparent shield and the other members of the team also were in that. Other comments about uh, about protecting the clinicians, the team members. Okay, that, could I make a comment, Brian? Yeah. Uh, I'm Edwin from the Philippines. I'm a cleft surgeon, an ENT surgeon to be specific. Uh, I think uh, it, it looks like uh, our situations would vary from uh, country to country, but at least in, in our situation, uh, right from the start at the OPD area, we have a triage system uh, based on uh, a checklist of symptomatology. And from there, uh, the, they are screened, whether they are seen uh, at the outpatient or at the COVID area or at the emergency room. Now, if a patient is uh, scheduled for surgery, we have set up protocols as well. Uh, one, of course, is uh, initially uh, we had no elective surgeries because uh, we did not have the capacity to uh, do PCR testing at the time. But in later months, uh, we st when we started opening the uh, outpatient or elective surgeries, uh, we set up certain protocols. One is that uh, they have to have a, a COVID test, a PCR test to be specific. Uh, another is uh, they are cleared by either the pediatrician or the uh, uh, internal medicine or uh, the uh, uh, infectious disease specialists. And then when they are, uh, they. Uh, they they pass this then they are they they are scheduled the soonest time possible uh, and then we do the surgery the level of PPE that we use will depend on how uh, on the clearance that we get if there is any doubt as to uh, whether they may be positive or not uh, then we we wear a full PPE which includes a rabbit suit a uh, N95 mask a face shield, the works. Uh, if, if not, then we uh, just the useful OR, uh, uh, OR uh, suits will be sufficient. So that's, that's the system uh, we have started to work with. Uh, as, uh, you, as far as the, your question on uh, uh, whether we use loops, I've uh, been doing uh, cleft and lip and palate surgeries for quite some time, and I've never had to use loops or a microscope, really. Uh, the only uh, 
in my older years because I'm 66 already. The only uh, thing that I would use now would just be a reading glass uh, behind my face shield. Face shield. So uh, that's at least from, from our experience in, in the Philippines. Thank you. What about the patients? Um, I, I, that was an interesting comment from Carolina about uh, the risks to the patients in traveling to the hospital. Uh, how, how many of your patients, are, and coming into the hospital, of course, how many of your patients, I'm sure this will be discussed in other round tables, but how many of your patients are, are unwilling to come uh, because they're frightened of, of the travel and they're frightened of the hospital? Any comments? Uh, as far as uh, our patients are concerned, they are willing to come. <laughs> our problem is uh, we have a lot of, uh, you know, roadblocks. Uh, one is uh, coming into the city because uh, uh, in, in, in our areas, uh, there are certain regions uh, uh, that have high COVID uh, concentrations and uh, in certain areas, uh, in certain regions, we have a low COVID concentrations. So coming from an outside area with a high COVID concentration, they have to have a uh, travel permits. They have to have uh, a, a medical certificate from their area of travel and things like that. So those, that's one impediment to their coming in. The other thing is uh, when, they, when they travel, uh, since many of these are, are indigent, uh, the cost of traveling also is one impediment to their coming in. Uh, the other impediment to their coming in as well is that if they come to the, to the, to, to the hospitals, then they will have to, you know, uh, 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 spend for, uh, not only for the transportation, but also for their, uh, for their uh, living uh, expenses while in the in the area because basically if they're uh, operated on it takes about uh, a minimum of three days uh, for their lips and a minimum of four or five days of stay in, in 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 the area so if they come from outside that's an impediment for them from coming in but they are definitely willing if uh, they get sponsors and they when they get sponsors they just come in and uh, we we go to the process of the surgery karen i think you had a comment yeah we we've, we've definitely experienced that patients are scared of coming to the hospital and even if we have or time uh and we offer it to them a lot of them have said we're, we're too scared to come in but a lot of it is also based on who they live with. So if they come from a multi-generational household, they're afraid of exposing um, the elderly people in their homes to the virus as well. And so, you know, I think a lot of it is education on how safe can we make it for the patients in the hospital um, with the testing. And, you know, maybe there's too much of a focus on testing the patients and not enough of a focus of assuring the patients that we've also, um, been tested and are negative and are, are keeping them safe. Thank you. So uh, we have to wind up in five minutes. And uh, I think that's been a very interesting chat uh, a very interesting discussion with some interesting ideas. Obviously, the situation has uh, is very different in different parts of the world, um, and of and and anxiety levels are obviously very different in different parts of the world. Uh, some of you being fairly laissez-faire, not too worried, and some of you going the full the full hog and wearing you know, full PPE and so on. Um, it'll be very interesting to share all these experiences in the future. I think what's, um, what, what, what's come out of it is that we're all part of this risk management 
process. Uh, it, it's not just the surgeon and it's not just the uh, anesthesiologist, but we have to think of the patient, we have to think of the nurses who are caring for the patients, uh, the, 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 all of the team members, the people who are really in the front line in many ways are the, are the dental uh, specialties who are, have no alternative but to get up close to the patients. And it, it really makes it even more important that we communicate as a team, that everybody's involved. Uh, it's easy for surgeons to forget that it's the anesthesiologists who are actually doing perhaps the most risky procedures of all in, a, in an operation. Um, so I think, uh, I think one of the, what we've learned is what we've, what we've uh, shared together is how we can make it safer for the patient and for all members of the team.